Thanks, Jeff, and, and thanks again to everyone for coming. Most importantly, uh, thanks to you and your teams for all your help. Um, it's really made a difference. We've gotten some really great progress since we last talked. Um, the site visits were really informative, um, and I'm excited to go, go through and kind of get your feedback on some of the things that we've done. So we're on slide 14 in the binder. Um, flipping to the, the next slide. It, basically, what I want to go through today is briefly recap the recommendations here, um, and, and before I begin, I'd be remiss not to introduce Dan Tanglerini, the acting administrator from GSA, who's partnered with us on all of this, and will be helping walk through some of this as well. We had we have three kind of strategic and tactical elements that we want to talk through on strategic sourcing. The first is the the key components of our focused federal effort that we've stood up around strategic sourcing over the last few months. Um, the second is some tactical potential targets for commodity areas for this year, based on a lot of feedback and conversation we had at the last full board meeting, looking at kind of the combination of uh, dollar amounts, which are higher is better, complexity and, and commodity kind of move towards the lower end of the value chain, and where are those sweet spots to start as we build inertia and go forward. And then lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, a prices paid information sharing tool, a prices paid portal that we want to create based on one of the best practices we heard over and over around price transparency. And you guys gave us some feedback about how we can move forward there and dealing with vendors and others. So the recommendations that, that you all gave us and, and formally adopted on the call fell into these three buckets. Make sure that we have government-wide policy directives and that those mandate the use of these vehicles where appropriate and have a senior accountable official at each agency on the hook for results. Secondly, we've got to step up our data collection, our utilization of that data, um, both through requests of the vendors themselves and then also some internal standardization around the way we track and um, measure performance here. Lastly, we have to make sure we're communicating these things. Top-down communications are the importance here. All of you talked about the importance um, or the, the critical nature to the success of your endeavors when the head of the organization said, this is important to me, this is not an ancillary function, this is core to us capturing savings, driving value into our mission, um, as well as once you had successes, highlighting those and syndicating those around, lifting them up. So the point is, and I was watching the previous segments on the uh, White House website, and Gail, you and Jeff had the whole conversation about the carrot is you save these dollars, you can invest a number of them in the mission. Now there's a huge carrot for the taxpayer because we're gonna put a bunch of this back into the treasury and, and towards deficit reduction, but it's really a win-win on that point. And then we need to create the framework that I'm hesitant to say stick, but creates you know uh, very limited room for leakage and those types of things and encourage best practice. <coughs> so moving to slide 16, here are the, the key components of our effort right now. Um, we're really uh, targeting three uh, areas as we implement this. The first is, and, and this this slide lays it out, standing up some commodity teams in targeted categories which will create additional government-wide vehicles and is populated by senior leaders from the key agencies, um, like the folks at this table, who commit their spend through them. So it's, a, you know, looking at the slides, a focused effort, on, instead of boiling the ocean, addressing every agency, focusing on the, the top spending agencies, partnering with GSA as a lead agency on a number of these cost savings um, initiatives. Secondly, having this body both at a senior level but across a functional level. You know, Steve Van Roke will talk a lot about portfolio stat in, in the first session. Well, IT is an $80 billion segment of the, procurement, the government procurement pie, so we absolutely need to partner with the CIOs. Danny's going to talk about improper payment and, and all of his great work with the CFOs. We need those CFOs, those purse string holders in the room too. So we've populated not just with acquisition professionals, but with those content experts as well, CFOs, CIOs, and other senior leaders. Lastly, you know, under Jeff's clear direction, uh, we're setting very aggressive goals. You know, we're looking for transformational change here, um, not just baby steps. So the way that we're kind of creating the framework is first, set up these commodity teams uh, governed by these core components. Secondly, let's capture some initial wins. Let's get some, some quick wins, both through some targeted commodity areas and improved demand management. And Dan's actually gonna walk through a bunch of that in, in just a minute. And then lastly, again, this price is paid portal to increase the internal government transparency, the price we paid. We've just seen huge impacts from uh, even the, the incremental steps we've made there already. So when we meet early next year, what I'm hoping is that we'll be discussing new vehicles we've stood up the increased adoption of the vehicles we already have, and all the uh, increased savings that we'll be driving. You know, that's kind of the path as you help us kind of give us more input as we mature down this road. 
So slide 17 uh, talks a little bit about when I say we're targeting and we're being focused, what does that mean? Well, of the $535 billion the government spent, we can't just look at everything. You know, we're not going to strategically source necessarily fighter planes, t tanks, warships, all of these types of things. So let's look at what's really addressable. And that's where we come up with about a $150 billion pie, a big, sizable, meaty chunk where we can drive significant savings. Okay, so that's being focused in what segments and industries we look at. We also need to be focused in the buyers. So we took the big seven agencies, DOD and any conversation about buying is the, the, the big dog in the room. They're about 70% of all procurement. But then the next six agencies represent an additional 20%. So by just focusing on seven agencies, we cover 90% of the spending. Classic you know, Pareto model right there. And uh, we feel that that can both cut through any bureaucracy on decision making. Again, spend commitment is huge and also cover the vast majority of the spend. And we're still absolutely opening up these vehicles to the smaller agencies so they can leverage the great prices we'll get predicated on DOD and, and other agency spending. So the go forward plan, and, and I know I'm going a little bit quickly given Jeff's uh, in of time, but I want to ask a few questions here is, as I transition to Dan, we've got a few solutions that we've stood up on the right hand side of this page. We've got, a f we've got about five more that we're ready to sprint on right now. And then again, I'm convening this uh, strategic sourcing leadership council group to, to stand up even more all in, in this year. But I wanted to get a f kind of a few perspectives from you on the savings themselves. You know, Debbie, you've, uh, something that resonated with me and, and that we've kind of used as a, an operating mantra is put the dollars on the screen. It's, it exactly translates to all of our agencies have different missions. You know, Raphael's trying to protect and secure the homeland. NASA's trying to do things. You know, everybody's got a different mission, but they all jointly can, you know, that, that message resonates. Put the dollars on the mission, put the dollars on the screen. When we do things like this at cost saving, we want to put most of those dollars back into the coffers, you know, for the taxpayer, but some of it we want to, we want to reinvest. How do you guys make that decision when you think about you do a cost savings initiative, how much do you give back to the shareholders or the donors, and how much do you reinvest in programs that you think will still be accretive to value, but make that trade off? Well, you, I think you said it, it's the value of the programs. Don't spend the money just for the sake of spending the money. Uh, the compelling part, the compelling items on the table that you can't do that you need to find the money to do will drive it. In some years, you don't have a good idea to spend it against, and you should drop it all. And other years, you really need to make an investment to move something forward. So, I would I would not be in favor of a percentage spend back approach because I do think that's a peanut butter thing. Yes. You need to invest to the idea. Yeah. Okay. In some years, there's just not any things on the table that need to be done that should take priority priority over returning those dollars. Other years, you need the whole thing because you have a really important initiative. So match so. the individual and potential investments against the savings. Yeah, price. and it's a group percent of the percent automatically I've goes. never okay. liked okay. the percent strategy for that exact reason because it's not what you find is that funds are spent on projects that aren't worthy of it just because they're being turned back. Yeah. You could just um, create a war chest. So yeah. if you're trying to save 10% and you want you have in your head you're going to give 5% back to the taxpayers. You take that other 5% and you have people um, construct project asks against mm -hmm. it. Right. Um, and if you know, worthy, I, I've done that in the for-profit space and the non-profit mm -hmm. space where you look at the return on investment for each of these projects. And you know, if it's worthy, you dole out the money. And if not, you know, more goes back to the taxpayers. But in terms of incenting people for it, um, you know, you could have a blend of examples of um, projects that are funded because we were able to cut the money. And you know, the, the interesting thing is so much of this is other people's money. It's, yes. Not, yes. it's not their money. So it's, it's all goodness. Yes. So um, part of it is examples of projects that are going to get funded as a result because then more people want to save more money. Mm -hmm. And then other parts of it is there's just some way to translate what it means to the taxpayer. And even if it's you know, like a half of one cent, it, it somehow becomes more real. Yes. You know, if every department did this, it could be, you know, because yeah. that's a, a really good way to talk to people that, that work in government. I mean, because they really do care about the citizens in this country. No, I think that's right. And I mean, that's a constant messaging challenge that I have is 
the first sense, hey, I want to talk to you about procurement. People's eyes might glaze over a little bit. But when I talk about the dollars that we can really save here, right. people get really excited because mm -hmm. this, this is real money. I like to do it in terms of meals, blankets, you know, the things that the Red right. Cross does every day. Mm -hmm. And there's got to be some yeah. translation here. What's the equivalent? Here. Right. Mm -hmm. What's the equivalent? Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's great. And then one other question before we transition to Dan and walk through some of this is we've called from some of uh, your teams especially who, who are doing this every day some of the ways that you incentivize your, your folks to really focus on this mm -hmm. you know making again that top-down approach is big but then making them feel like this is part of my job I know I'm a mission oriented you know my, my primary duty is to care for these people who have mm -hmm. been displaced by a disaster or to put on a great show but this is important to the boss this is something right. I want to do and it translates to mine but in how do you do that without any monetary incentives you know some of the challenges that we have there um, I, I was thinking things like, you know, just Jeff sending emails or, you know, mm -hmm. graduatory notes or we highlight these things in the newsletter. We put a blog on whitehouse.com. You know, there's some of the things that we have in our toolbox right. for sure. And we've got a great bully pulpit. But I didn't know if you had best practices there that you'd maybe already seen or thought of. Is it is it in their performance goals? We are. That's, because if it, it's not, yes. you know, you got to start with, yes. with it's in their performance goals. And so at least they'll be recognized for, yes. you know, for playing ball and exceeding the, you know. Yep, and that's one of the ways that we intersect with uh, John Barry's team, talked about the SES evaluations. That's one of those areas as well. And then I've actually, met, next week is my last one. Uh, I mean, with every single agency, one-on-one, -on -one and similar portfolio stat, we like the stat title here. So it's ACSTAT, Acquisition Status Updates. And this has been in every single one where they give us all of the data for what they've done to date. They've heard the priorities, they've obviously seen the conversation we've been having and your recommendations. And so that's uh, fostered a good conversation, too. That's another, kind of another way to do it, because we just had a presentation on IT and how much uh, different agencies had already pinpointed, um, is to make it competitive. And yeah, have I, I agree. People that uncover uh, the most savings be recognized by yeah. Jeff. Yep. Uh, or it's a it's an yeah. Yeah. It, and also, don't, don't underestimate. I think Deborah's point is great, because we've done that. We've set up contests among our five mm -hmm. divisions and five contests, and people take it personally. They're, you don't get money at the end of the day, but it is about, look, you know, who pulled. And you have all the visuals. You know, you have the pot being the, the pot being filled and yes. the temperature. And pe right. you know, let's face it, we're all wanting to do that and do well, and um, that works. You know, people want to succeed in in a, in a common mission. I, I think that's a huge point, and we've always heard since really we've been doing that. You know the limitations on compensation and the difference between the public and private sector. I totally think that's a great idea. Yeah. If you can't pay him, plaque. We set it up as a yeah. horse race where it's we literally, really like, true. like in an arcade, you had the horses moving yeah. forward. Believe it or not, people were obsessed. The first thing they did was stop and see where the horse was at the end of that month. Like, where are we at the end of the month? Towards it was called, you know, race, race for the dollars, and uh, you know. And then they could have fun against it, like, you know, this it's like you pulled up lame, you know, et cetera. Right. This conversation <laughs> is reminding me when I was a branch manager, God, I was so young, but um, I had 100 salespeople working for me, and they were highly compensated if they made big sales. And just almost like a throwaway thing, yeah. I said, if every one of you makes your, object your objectives, we'll have a huge pizza party, you know, pizza on me. And this was more motivational than the it's huge paychecks true. they were going to get for the comp plan. But it was like this spirit of teamwork. And, you know, they started push, poking at each other. How come you didn't make it? I'll go make calls with you if you can't make it. it it's that psychic gratification. Right. Yeah, exactly. Can you give you another example? Exactly. I'm on a, a not-for-profit board, and we have a gala every year in uh, D.C. And it had kind of stagnated in terms of fundraising. Well, I got a whole new group of vice chairs in, and just on the email system, people started yeah. shouting out when they got a donation. <laughs> so everyone really yeah. jumped up, you know, had a, sold a $10,000 table, dollar table, and everyone said, congratulations, and then someone came back five minutes later, I sold a five. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, just that excitement yes. of I mean, the, immediate recognition. At the end of the day, done. you're right, everyone wants what? the star right. from the teacher, yeah. the gold star yeah. from the teacher. We're not different than we were when we were seven or eight. Right. And it's yeah. a nice way to simultaneously do the foster competition, but build camaraderie simultaneously. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. everyone's pulling for the same thing. And I think Liz said this before, 
there, ne there never is enough budget, and I, I see it all the time in my company. One year we'll focus on programming because that's important, but you get the programming to where it needs to be, and it's like, oh, we don't have enough money for marketing. So, you know, when executives see that and they know each year you set priorities and that there's a limited pot, if you can grow that pot by saving on things that you don't really, you know, necessarily need or are done, you get the same thing for a little price. Right, right. Yeah. Another example, we had, um, you know, when Blackberries came out, uh, for a while we had executives, everyone was carrying a cell phone and a Blackberry, and no one liked to use Blackberries for calls. So they're walking around with two devices, and iPhones come out, and then the phone gets better. So one day our IT department just said, the new rule is you can't have two devices, you have to have a BlackBerry, you have to use the phone on the BlackBerry, and we're only, you can't have unlimited calls. I mean, you can have unlimited calls, but we're just gonna reimburse you $100 a month for the calls you make. So those family calls that we know everyone makes, <laughs> or the calls that you're gonna have your to pay dime. for them. It's just amazing the amount of savings we got from that simple and I think that's a perfect transition because we're gonna Dan's gonna walk through some of the the potential commodities, but also the demand management that right. you just you just outlined. Yeah. So thanks, Joe. And uh, I'd have to say I'm not one of those people whose eyes glaze over yes. when you start. Talking. I appreciate that. Thank you. And I'm really glad that this group isn't either. And and I want to start where you started. Frankly, having the leadership of this group, um, having the support of Jeff, and having the support of Joe really sends a signal into the entire organization that we take this very seriously, we're committed to these outcomes, and it really gets people to come to the table and really cooperate. You can't underestimate the power of executive leadership in any organization, but certainly in government. What we've been doing is working collectively with Joe, uh, OMB, and the entire agency um, portfolio is really exploring the places where we think we can continue to push and make progress within strategic sourcing. We've identified five commodity areas that we want to pursue in FY13 desktop software, that's the, that's the office supply equivalent of computer software, uh, wireless, um, looking just along mm -hmm. the exact point you made, thinking about ways that we can better manage uh, our, our wireless communication. Um, janitorial and sanitation products, so that is, you know, again, thinking about the office supply model, thinking about those commodities, where are the places where we can very easily, and without really, um, uh, you know, without really getting into anyone's particular line of business that they <coughs> deeply care about, uh, find places for um, uh, savings. Maintenance, repair, and operations, that's spare parts, that's filters, spare, you know, uh, spare parts for heating systems, and then rental cars for efficient, official government travel. What we've done is that let's think about um, uh, kind of three dimensions by which we can explore the entire field of commodities that we could go and look and see where there are opportunities. And we've, we've set a, 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 a kind of a list of parameters, value, complexity, strategic impact. Value, the potential, potential for duct, reducing total cost of ownership in the near term. Complexity, which is difficulty to develop and implement, and strategic impact. Does this align uh, the solution with other OMB and administration priorities? And I, I, I would like to stop for a second and say, is that the right approach for us to pursue? Well, I like, I like the, the value, complexity, total cost. The, the question I ask is, how would you select, how'd you select these five? There's one that we had talked about, and it seems to go hand in hand with rental cars, it's hotel rooms. Right. Well, so it's fascinating. Airfare. We actually, travel. Yeah, travel. airfare, yeah. travel. Airfare, right. exactly. airfare is actually one of the things we already strategically source with our yeah. City Paris program. We just announced a new travel um, uh, uh, program a, com a, a single combined travel system by which um, uh, reservations will be made. And on hotel rooms, that's a broader policy issue that I'm going to be working with these guys on. There's some actual legal limitations on our ability to um, compete hotel rooms. Oh. We do have something called Fed Rooms, which is a, uh, a competition within the limitations we have where we, we think that there's some savings. And we're working with uh, OMB and with the agencies to see if we can move more business towards it. And just to pick up on a comment Deb made, when she when she talked about the switch to you know using Blackberry, mm -hmm. that was a bit of a vision, you know, like somebody had a vision. This is how we're going to do things. But some of the question is, are we also thinking about how we become not just doing what we used to do and doing it uh, more cost effective? So a great example is on you have an example about printing. Yes. You know, get rid of printing. I mean, most people are getting some form of tablet device. I mean, we could PDF this whole presentation and not have to reproduce. 
reduce it. So who's got the who's thinking about the vision of not just getting better pricing, but also changing. Changing. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a great point, and it's something that we're working on collectively and why this group isn't just a bunch of acquisition folks. It's the, the CIOs who are thinking about where is this going, one device policy stuff that Steve's team's working on. Um, you know, GSA's actually been a leader in the use of tablets and, and exactly. everything. So how do you do that sort of thing? And then having folks like Rafael from, from Homeland Security and, and other leaders in this community who, who have a broad management portfolio at the user perspective, the agency perspective, say, what's really working? How can we do things better? That whole kind of, uh, you know, save award and somebody raises their hand and says, look, I don't know if anybody's going to hear me, but I've got a better way to do this. And then quickly grabbing that and circulating and syndicating to all the other agencies. Just nice to see you say, you know how much everybody's printing, for example, and make it a contest, as we said earlier, to say, you, know, you print less, mm -hmm. you get the prize. I mean, it's, In, it's not, it's not, it's just, I think you should do the print savings you're describing. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But, uh, you're, you're exactly right. The whole war on waste thing goes yeah, well, very it. well on organizations. You know, yeah. it's, it, it's a source. Because also you have a whole, the whole sustainability issue. It's not just cost. Right. It's like, stop using, you know, we gotta, we got to address the paper issue. And yeah. we've so got we really, we really have, have a war on waste. We have our campaign to cut waste, and we've made printing, uh, part of that, and we talk about double-sided, we talk about number of printers per employees, trying to get to a ratio mm -hmm. that makes sense, but, but uh, Enrique, you said no printing. I'm wondering, is there a corporate best practice here? We, we, we're not at yeah, that slow. point, um, but if there's a way to get down to a very de minimus level of printing, that's something that we, you know, we could like to track with. Go there, I mean, it's, you can go there pretty quickly. Make it a contest. I think actually we have a good example. My last assignment over a treasury, we adopted station. one of our high priority goals, a paperless treasury. And that actually freed us up for an opportunity to look at policy and ask ourselves, do we really have to mail benefit checks to everyone? And we actually have a proposal that at the end of uh, middle of next year, we'll be eliminating paper benefit checks. It's actually a better result for the customer, a huge cost reduction exactly. in the organization. Yeah. And so that's the trick, is finding those places where we actually have within the organization thought the next dimension, support it with the strategic sourcing effort. Absolutely. Um, support it. But I think you get me on to my next slide, which was, is this idea of demand management. Are there places where we can explore best practices in agencies and best practices in the private sector, mm -hmm. setting rules, mm -hmm. uh, sharing um, sharing best practices and experiences. We've set up a, this print-wise activity, which is not just a strategic sourcing mechanism for buying stuff, it's actually a strategically sourced mechanism for people to share best practices and information. Yes. Knowing what the industry standard ratio of desktop printers are per person, six to 12, and then beginning to get agencies to see where they stand against that benchmark yeah. has a very powerful impact on the agency. I know where I am. I'm at 6.5. I want to be up at 12. I want to be at 12.5. I want to be better than the industry standard. And I think to your point, everyone who takes one of these jobs and is in a leadership position, they want to be the best at what they're doing. We just need to give them some scorecard by which they can measure. Um, yeah, basketball. a random thought, but on the printer side, yeah, we were pounding the table two-sided, less color, you know, the whole routine. And this grassroots group of, you know, millennial yes. types Sustainable. pulled together and basically shamed us yeah. into yeah. doing this Just across the board. The Everything from how that. many paper towels mm -hmm. you use. Yeah. And yeah. I that mean, generation you just aim them at yeah. this, and there's something more compelling than mm -hmm. a group of overpassionate. <laughs> and they're they're in the government. There is no doubt in my mind. You've got a handful of them. So it's a, it you know, it, it, you've got a lot of do-gooders in your organization. And if you do this in terms of not just dollars saved, but carbon footprint or whatever, you know, it's going to make a difference. Are there other ways we can, you know, monetize it or measure? Absolutely. And that actually gets to slide 20. No, I was going to say, quickly, on your PrintWise website, you know, for the internal folks, it shows agencies, okay, if you've done this, how many dollars you saved? That's yes. great, but also how many trees you've saved. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. I know, you know, that's Makes somewhat made light of at times, but it resonates yeah. with yeah, folks. Sure. Yeah, that's a big deal. That's a great number. Right. The, the one thing I would just, you know, say is that it's very hard to take stuff away, right? Yes. Right. Yes. So, you know, just taking a page from, you know, uh, if as you launch new programs, launch them without a printing option. Yeah. 
Okay, because it is very difficult to take it away. So I'm just thinking about an Avon example, like, you know, we have that brochure, 180 pages, and so when they launched in Finland, they, the, uh, the brochure was only available online type of thing. Right. So taking it away is very difficult, but everything you do from now on, make it electronic only right. so that you never have that era of how do I transition this? And, and it's amazing that people figure it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, no, that's yeah. fine. And I, 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 um, I think that gets us actually to, to my last slide, which is slide 20, which is really in order to do it, we need to be smarter about having the data, really understanding where our spend is and how much we spend. Um, so one of the things we're working on is developing a prices paid portal. It's the, the old adage, you know, if we only knew what we knew or what we know. And that's the idea is to try to figure out what agencies are paying, even in janitorial and sanitation, without a strategically sourced initiative, we know that the GSA vehicle saves agencies about 17% over the average that they're already paying. So if we could move people just to the existing system while we then bring that scale together and then push that scale into the marketplace, yes. we think that there's actually savings to be reaped immediately and then savings that could be built on. By the way, you know, we went back to the original value ownership complexity. Transparency, visibility may, may be something that you care yeah. about because that's what you actually just described. Yep. Yes. You said this is about visibility and transparency and what people yeah. are doing. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And we think that actually what we need to do is have visibility into how each of us are acting because, again, it gets to this contest nature. I know DHS doesn't want to pay more than HHS. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's the trick is if, mm -hmm. and particularly if we have a vehicle where we have a price point that's better than what any other agency has, then the agency has permission in a way yeah. to not spend the time, effort, and energy in building their own structure for going out and making that purchase. It backs people into strategic sourcing mm -hmm. in a way that they're actually moving towards the goal in a measurable way. And then they can bring those results to their leadership and say, hey, look what I found. It was sitting on the street in the form of savings. Yeah. So, so I know we're up at our... Uh, Any last question? I mean, well, I, well, one comment I have is, so we, we talked about $150 billion estimated. Yes. And, and we're talking about increment of $9 billion. So there are, the, uh, there are about 20 different categories. We, so we put together this group of cross-functional leadership. They met uh, about a month ago. Then in... Two weeks after that, they set up implementation teams to, to build a bunch of kind of profiles of uh, other commodity areas. They've got about 20 of those that they're going to present back to the leadership group next week. Um, and that'll be all uh, on top of those, the three we've already started and the five that GSA is running with, so that we can keep going after them. But we just wanted to show you kind of that first tranche of quick wins and things stood up. And then the second piece, you know, is still uh, in its leadership phase. So they'll be getting the other, you know, just a few days. It just feels like, so yep. it seems like there's a lot more. Yeah. It was like to the point, and Jeff made this point in the last meeting, is, hey, start down here, move up the complexity Absolutely. chain, and that's exactly what yeah. we're trying to do. Yeah. Because we'll get, we'll build that uh, positive inertia. Well done. Does it feel good? Thanks. Uh, I do want to, just a quick plug, I've got our acting commissioner of Federal Acquisition Service, Mary Davey, here. We've got our chief acquisition officer, Ann Rung. And uh, we got Rick Miller, who's been helping out a lot, too. So I wanted them to uh, have Great. a chance. Well to done. Good, Good job, guys. Great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well done. Thank so, you. But I do want to keep us uh, keep us the time just to know everyone has some uh, travel plans today. Uh, I, I completely agree. I completely agree. I'm so regretting my opportunity. Same with the SEC, the DSCS stuff. I feel really good. Going to Baltimore for the Johns Hopkins board meeting that starts this afternoon tomorrow. And I miss the debates, everything, watching that ball game. Diehard Yankees fan. I mean, I do not want to be in Baltimore. Oh. I just right. don't want to be in Baltimore. Oh, we have that one phone call. Whether they win or Yeah, they're nice fans. They're really nice it was fans. Beautiful ball 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 ball. I love the Hampton Yards and the fans. I have I have when I went to Hampton, you could go to Memorial yeah. Stadium yeah. for yeah. I mean, right. 50 cents in a Johns Hopkins street night deal. Important. And I went to every Yankee game because it was just blocks away, literally, from the campus. 
And the fans have always been gracious. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's exactly. been fans. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, but... Did you make a I don't even know what I don't know. I don't know. They'll be there tonight. They're so lucky. I know, and I thought we were pretty much with them. I don't think we liked much to the end. Is my pay going to go up? Except for because all the other works are so good. Me too. That's what I was saying. So spot. It doesn't have a work. I was like, it was two to one. They, the bats were dead. I mean, it was another Total win. Great. Why don't we go ahead and get started again? It might have been one for six. All that money. Okay. Um, yeah. Apologies uh, for uh, a quick uh, out and back in, uh, swapping out some of the folks. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that we um, uh, recognize all folks who have just joined us. Obviously, we have uh, Dan Corfo, uh, the federal controller, who's been leading our, our efforts. Um, uh, we also are joined by uh, Seth Harris. Everybody. Deputy Secretary of the Department of Labor, and Dick Gregg, uh, who has joined us from the Treasury Department. Hi. Great. Dick, so, why don't you uh, go ahead and uh, we're, take we're us? We're on uh, the next page over from Strategic Source and the Improper Payment section. Um, let, me, let me start with a little bit of, of context and background before I get into the specifics. Um, I do want to spend a lot of time detailing in the slides the history of improper payments. We've been through that before. Just, just recall that the, there's a broad spectrum of root causes of errors that we make. At one end of the spectrum, we still continue to make the more basic errors. Uh, someone is ineligible because they've been suspended or debarred. Someone owes a delinquent, has a tax delinquency or other type of delinquency. Uh, they might be imprisoned. They might be dead. And we make those payments. And those are the we sometimes call the more basic errors that we make. And then at the other end of the spectrum, there's a much more complex scenario in terms of validating eligibility, like is the person back at work? What is the person's household size? Are there adjusted gross income for their family? These are relevant elements to determine whether a benefit should be paid out, and we don't always have a trusted available source to tap in to know as soon as someone is back at work, and then Seth knows, okay, stop the UI, the unemployment payment. We don't have that real-time information often. So what we have learned over time is that there are ways to use data strategically to build risk profiles and analysis that can help us make more informed decisions because we don't have perfect information. Now, the other point I wanted to make is we've had a variety of different interactions with the working group, uh, and they've ranged from guiding principles uh, which we'll talk a little bit about here. We've been given specific tools. For example, Motorola provided us a primer on how to provide different uh, uh, risk judgments and, and looking at data anomalies, and that was uh, helpful. I think that, that a lot of the, the work of the PMAP really synthesized for the improper payments team when we did a site visit to Aetna and met with their, they spent an entire day with us uh, and gave us a fantastic presentation on how they use data and analytics to look for error trends and fraud and, 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 do, and, and drive their, their mission and, and their service delivery. Um, and uh, it, well, there was a lot to take from that, uh, from that presentation. It blended some of the guiding principles. It blended the specifics. What, what impacted me was seeing how many different parts of the organization came together. Uh, it was, there was no sense at all that the data analytics team was out on an island. It was very clear to me that the data analytics team was very integrated <coughs> into the business lines, and so there was a common understanding of what the customer needed, and, and that was important. But I think the, the biggest thing that I took away from it was how clear the bottom line was for everyone involved. They all, they every, and, and some of them weren't in the room at the same time, but when they came in the room to give their presentation, they were on the same exact song sheet in terms of what the bottom line thing that the business was trying to achieve and how the metrics were helping inform that bottom line. Um, and that is something that, um, that we want to make sure that we're embracing. Uh, within the federal context and having this combination of greater integration 
to the people that are actually in charge of making the payment and determining eligibility with the folks that can help them do the data analytics. Um, and that we all have a common understanding of what we're trying to achieve, which is uh, uh, not proven easy to have that type of clarity sometimes in government and in particular in federal financial management. So with that, um, turning to the slide, which my slide isn't numbered, but it's uh, slide 22. Slide 22. Um, you know, at the top, you know, just the, the overarching questions. We, we wanted to learn best practices from uh, corporate organizations in using data to drive down error. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that we were getting feedback based on you learning about our challenges, what you think we should be doing to more effectively tackle this issue. Uh, at the bottom here, you see kind of a relationship that we're starting to see between the various input that you've given and the actions that we take. You know, there was a big push from the working group on prioritization. So we have focused our efforts over the past uh, several months on unemployment insurance and our government-wide do-not-pay solution, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, another thing that came across from the PMAB was to, uh, to try new things, to pilot game-changing approaches and to you know kind of break the glass ceiling, so to speak, on things that we've been doing. And in doing so, there was an undercurrent of thinking about incentives and governance in, um, in, in piling those game-changing approaches. So one of the things that Seth is going to talk about is that uh, we are launching a new state-led model for addressing UI errors, which is um, trying to encapsulate innovation with kind of a different governance model, because this is going to be owned by the states who we need to feel more ownership over theirs because these are programs are essentially administered by the states. Um, there was a, a very, from almost the first meeting, in particular when, when, when you handed us off to some of the folks on your staffs, it was a lot about standardization, standardization of data, standardization of business processes, that in other words, data analytics will hum more freely if you enable the foundation to be standardized in terms of systems and data. Treasury is initiating an effort to standardize all disbursement data, which we think obviously is going to be important. We're not going to wait until that's done because we're already working on the issue, but we believe that will free up a whole host of new analytics um, that, uh, that will help us be more effective. And then, and then obviously I mentioned the site visit uh, and other types of discussions um, that are providing us more input on how to do data analytics, how to evaluate risks differently, how to determine the top ROI opportunities. Um, as I transition into Seth's presentation, I think the key for us is, um, in particular as the Labor Department works with New York State, uh, who's going to uh, shepherd in this new data uh, center is how do we make sure that we take what we learned at Aetna, for example, and make sure that there isn't a barrier between those learnings and what's going to happen with the UI new, uh, new uh, integrity center. So with that, let me turn it over to Seth. Great. Thanks, Danny. Thanks to all of you. Uh, happy to provide an update on uh, how we're doing with UI improper payments. Um, and I want to pick up on Danny's point that uh, uh, we are uh, doing our very best to follow your advice, which is very good advice. So one of the pieces of advice he gave us was prioritize. So Danny talked about the government prioritizing UI, which they most certainly have, and it's become a priority in my life as a result. Um, but even within UI, we are prioritizing. So we have been able, I think we gave you this description last time, we have been able to identify what are the root causes of the improper payment, and we've taken on three of the top four causes because we think that's where we're going to get the biggest yield. Interestingly, we didn't, we've taken on uh, root causes one, two, and four. We've skipped over number three, because, which is, by the way, work search, because we, it's just we don't know what the right thing to do is yet. We don't really have a solution. So we're focusing on those places where we think we can actually um, get a yield quickly. Um, you also told us to pilot some game-changing approaches and to invest in data analytics and data mining. and so. Uh, as Danny mentioned, stepping on my big announcement, because um, <laughs> uh, my notes say I'm pleased to announce, but now it's announced already. Uh, but uh, the Labor Department ran a competition in which six states uh, competed to run the new UI Center for uh, new UI Integrity Center for Excellence. New York State won that competition and will be receiving 15 million dollars 
uh, for over the course of two years to be the lead organization in running a UI um, uh, integrity center. Seth, what was the basis of the competition? On what basis? Um, it, you know, we had uh, uh, we had a number of criteria for the states. First of all, had they already demonstrated a leadership role? Two was, did we think that they had a grasp of their own um, situation? Uh, the other was their proposal with respect to how they were going to go after this big problem of, of data analytics and data mining. Um, well, interestingly, I won't, I won't point any fingers, but there was one state that competed uh, that has one of the worst UI improper payment rates in the country. Um, that was relevant to the decision. They don't yet have a grasp of what's going on in their, uh, their own state and how to solve those problems. Um, so we, here's what we're going to ask this integrity center to do. Uh, or uh, in, 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 integrity, uh, we've got to come up with another name. Integrity Center of Excellence maybe is too, a little too uh, loaded. <laughs> so what are they going to do? They're going to identify, building on their own experience, picking up on your question, they're going to uh, identify what they think are promising techniques and tools that deter, not only deter fraud, but identify fraud. Um, that is going to be done in partnership with Treasury's Do Not Pay initiatives. Since we have these two things running in parallel, we're going to bring them together through this uh, initiative. Uh, it's going to be a clearinghouse for best practices, and I'll talk about how they're going to get other states involved in just a second. Uh, technology is going to be a very important uh, issue. UI, um, uh, the UI system, or the 53 UI systems that we have in our country uh, are at varying levels of technological sophistication. Some of them are using COBOL. Some of them are using the most sophisticated 2012 data. It's just a matter of resources, what they have available to them. So they're going to identify technology tools that are readily deployable across all the states. Uh, and they're going to focus a good bit on training. Since most of this work is done by live human beings, once you have the requisite data, they're going to focus on uh, training staffs on fraud solutions and integrity strategies. I just want to spend one second on why we did a state-led initiative. Um, we are, uh, the UI system looks more like Medicaid than it does like Medicare in this regard. Medicare, the checks are cut at the federal level. Medicaid, they're cut by the states. In UI, we don't cut the checks at the federal level. 53 different state systems using 53 different sets of rules cut the checks for varied reasons at varied levels according to different caps. It's, it's very complicated. So the idea of putting a fraud center in the Labor Department, sort of dealing with addressing Danny's question of data analytics being integrated with the actual decision making, the claims ma uh, processing system, it made no sense because we don't do any of the claims processing system. It's but all I'm done sorry to interrupt, but, sure, but go ahead. to use your own analogy, you do have CMS uh, doing Medicaid fraud in HHS. Well, but right? they are focusing on how to get the states involved in how to address that fraud problem. Right. Having, a, having a centralized system would have required them and us to have data taken out of the existing systems that operate in processing in the states and sent to us for analysis, it's not only inefficient, it's, it wouldn't have worked. Right. It wouldn't have worked. Right. You'd have to build a whole new system in order for, to, to, to help. It wouldn't have been very helpful. So the idea was, and again, rather than having, a, uh, having 53 states try to do it or having a, an organization that tried to organize all 53 states, we want to have a vanguard state working with a small number of other states and then working with the National Association of State Workforce Agencies, which is the trade association of the state government agencies that do this work be responsible for proliferating the knowledge out through the various states. So that will be the mechanism by which we get it into each So the end state states. is each state will have its own center? No, no, no. We're going to have the one center that is going to be a knowledge center, essentially, and a testing ground. And New York will be the guinea pig for a lot of the work that we're going to do. And then that knowledge, and, th and those decisions will be made, I'll talk about the steering committee in just a little bit, with a small group of other states and us participating in the decision making. And then the National Association of State Workforce Agencies and the steering committee will be responsible for getting that knowledge out to everyone. So rather than having, spending $750 million on 53 of these, we're going to have one, and they're going to share the knowledge that they develop, and they'll be the guinea pig, they'll be the testing ground. So there's a couple, two points in response to that. One is, um, you know, Seth referenced earlier a state that applied but had a high error rate. The, the notion was because New York's a leader, they're, they're going to help that state. Right. And then hopefully other centers can, can proliferate, but not 50 or 53. Right. Um, and we'll, we'll have to figure out what the cradle alcohol amount is. Right. 
But back to, I think you raised a really good question about you know, the Medicaid analogy. Because I think there is an open question for the, 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 that we want to work very closely with the Labor Department is what is the right thing that they should be doing with the states to ensure that the analytics program is thriving. Right. Now, CMS has this has the has has a certain even different or unique role than labor because they're doing all this Medicare work. They're right. learning about doctors that are stealing licenses right. or, you know, uh, the types of services that occur in which, you know, uh, they, they reimburse. And uh, I was at a presentation recently and they were showing that one of the fraud things that comes up is they reimburse for ambulatory services, but they were able to find that some of these ambulatory services aren't connected with an actual visit to a doctor. So someone's overbilling on the ambulatory services. That has relevance. Right to the in states med right. in their Medicaid efforts, right. and right. so it all feeds in. So we don't, have a, we don't have a Medicare analog, although the reason that we're integrating this process with Treasuries Do Not Pay is that's the closest analogy. Right. Exactly. That's the closest analogy. So when there's information that we gather from the Do Not Pay process, that will be fed through the, the Integrity Center to provide that information. Makes more state. sense. So. Great. Um, so let me talk, actually, since we just picked up, and let me talk a little bit about the governance structure. We're going to have a steering committee that will include, obviously, New York State, which will be the lead. They will also do the staffing. Um, we will be on the steering committee. The National Association of State Workforce Agencies will both sit on the steering committee, and they will help to identify a small number of additional states to sit on the uh, steering committee to help New York in its decision making and to help to disperse the learning. Um, so they'll be involved in things like RFPs, and they'll be involved in uh, uh, development of metrics. They'll be involved in assessing the progress in New York State. Uh, we will be involved in that process, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we want you, or hoping that you will be involved in that process. Um, so what's the center going to do, and what are our priorities for what the center is going to do? Um, again, following on to your advice, uh, we're not going to try and boil the ocean. Um, we're going to try and focus on the biggest priorities first um, and the places where, that we think are going to yield to effort most quickly. Uh, and that's going to be our big push, the Labor Department's big push. So one of the requirements is that they're going to establish a strategic plan that's going to identify project deliverables uh, for every priority that we identify, that the steering committee identifies with our advice. And then we're going to have timelines and we're going to have metrics for each of those uh, um, uh, pieces of the project. Standardizing data elements and related process to facilitate efficient data use. This is one of the biggest problems in UI. As I said, 53 sy systems, 53 different technology applications. Um, th there is, uh, it, it understates the case to say that standardization of data is a big issue in this area. So we're going to try and go after that. That's going to be a very complicated problem. The goal being to get to a data analytics and data mining model that can proliferate across all the states using whatever technology they have. So what we want to do there is identify fraud, but we also want to identify those folks who are likely to do something that may not be fraud, just inadvertently continuing to receive UI benefits, for example, after they go back to work. And then we want to be deeply involved in getting the states to clearly identify responsibility and organizational, set up systems of organizational accountability. We have succeeded in getting every state to establish a UI integrity task force in the state that brings together all the folks, the state tax agency, the state workforce agency. They are now all working together, but we want to make sure that you don't end up by diffusing responsibility by bringing everybody together, but making sure that you've clearly defined responsibility and held each part of the organization accountable. And also, we have to take our share of the uh, responsibility. As Danny was saying, we're not out of the loop here. We have to take responsibility for the system as a whole, and Danny holds us accountable for the numbers that we produce every year uh, on the UI rate. So that was slide number, I should have said, that was slide number 23 that I just walked you through. Um, slide number 24, let me talk about where, uh, where we're going and where I'm hoping you're going to be continue, continue to be involved. So we have to finalize the organizational structure for both the steering committee and the center itself. The cooperative agreement, which is the mechanism that we're using here between US DOL and New York DOL will be executed, we think, in the next, sometime in the next six weeks. It's a fairly complicated drafting exercise whenever we do business. Um, and we have to have a charter for the steering committee that's going to govern membership and responsibilities for the uh, steering committee. So we're hoping that will be done in the next six weeks. We're going to conduct an organizational staff assessment for the center. 
The deadline for that is March 31st of 2013. Um, then we want to identify strategies that will engage all the states. I mentioned that NASWA will play a role and that the steering committee will play a role. That's the level of depth that we have on exactly how we're going to proliferate this knowledge. We have to have a plan that's going to get the knowledge out, sharing products, deliverables, and knowledge with the other states. So that's going to be developed. Um, so let me talk about how we're hoping that you will remain involved in this process. Seth, can I ask a yeah, quick please, question? Yeah, go ahead. Is your end state that, the, that you stand up a few of these centers for excellence for each type of improper payment and they become the centralized um, location that the states use and they share the resource? Or ha how does it look at the end? Does every state stop doing everything they were doing? or? That, that's a terrific question, and the answer is we don't know yet. Okay. I think we, we, we need to stand up this center mm -hmm. and see how much they can bite off um, before we decide whether, whether we proliferate centers, and if so, how many we need, and what their focus is going to be. I, I don't want to be too glib about this, because um, this is a big, complicated problem. And we are, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we're seeing a response to effort. We're seeing an ROI so far. But we, we don't know yet what the barriers are. And so, the states don't mind ceding all this responsibility to another state? Are well, they, they haven't. Okay? The other states know that we competed this, mm -hmm. and they know that we're making a big push on improper payments. What we're offering is lots and lots of help. Got it. So it, what this does is this will reduce, for the other states, this will significantly reduce transaction costs and knowledge acquisition costs, and maybe technology testing and identification costs. Um, so what we're hoping is that we're going to get that, it's, this is all voluntary on their part, um, we're hoping we're going to get them involved because it's the path of least resistance. Got it. So let me, uh, let me add to that. I think we, our assumption, and we probably recognize that we don't need a lot of centers for geographic purposes. Right. We don't need a north, the world has right. changed to the point right. that California could just as easily leverage New York and they don't need a exactly. west coast version. What, what I'm hoping to see um, is that these centers, to the extent we need more than one, uh, develop expertise uh, around solutions that are proving effective. So I'll give you one example. Right now, on a separate work stream, we're piloting an approach with a few states where they're partnering with financial institutions, banks, right. to figure out whether they can get information on, hey, this, this, this is now a direct deposit for this individual. This individual's receiving direct deposits and wasn't three weeks ago, this is an indicator they might be back at work. That might be helpful information right. to the state. Now maybe the New York Center develops expertise in that. Maybe we need a center in Florida or something like right. that to develop that type of expertise. And so I'm California and I'm interested in knowing this about this bank thing. I go to that center right. and they give me the corporate cookbook on how to do it. Right. So that could be a model that we're, that we're interested in. Can I push on that? I mean, I completely agree with these new financial services, but the employer knows. Yeah. So you're catching it at the bank level. Why aren't employers more involved in helping this whole process? It could, that's an excellent point. There are two different employers involved, right? There's the employer who is the payor right. of the UI benefit, which is paid through taxes directly to the state, then there's the new employer. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm right. saying. So there's, right. So there is a system that we, uh, through our grant making process, have incentivized and really required every state to adopt called SIDES, which is exactly about, it's about the reason for separation. And then there's a second system called the NDNH, which tells you when people are newly employed. The problem is there's a significant data lag. It's, you don't get that information immediately. Well, in fact, what, I'm sorry, what I'm trying to figure out is the bank knows. The bank knows because the employer, the person making the payment, is actually contacted the bank. Right, but the employer then, the employer then, at some later point, not right away, yeah. notifies the NDNH, which is the National Directory of New Hires. So, so why not require the employer right, to do right that away. sooner? Right. Uh, we're trying, I'm, saying, we're I'm saying there's a process. Right. So what happens in direct payment, right, is the employee says, I want direct deposit. Right. The company that's actually going to issue the check says, okay, I'll set that up. Isn't that I mean, I Yeah, so, I, so here's a, right. the answer to that question is the same reason why we have a much bigger overpayment problem than an underpayment problem. Because, you know, if we if we have if, if we underpay an employee's salary, we learn about it really quick. Yeah, exactly. Okay? <laughs> right. Not if we overpay. Absolutely. So so going to your point, 
I'm an employer, right. and I have paper. I have paperwork to do. I have to do the sides thing or this national tour. I get to it, but I might not get to it eventually. But the notion that the employee is starting and the paperwork is going to be done on exactly how they're going to get paid and how that pay is going to transfer that typically happens very consistently and very quickly. So, it, yeah. so for the UI issue, it really is that time lag, and we get we get burned on that. And, and there's no way to just us. to force employers to do it. Yeah, I was going to say, why don't you put the why don't, why don't you put the burden on the employers? I mean, because you know, and, and, well, and, right and, now, all, the only so, thing we have the authority to do right now is to work. Let me tell you where we are. That's that's the ideal state. Most states were not using the NDNH at all. So we're trying to get every state now to use the NDNH, and we're close. We're getting there. Um, then we have to get employers to give their information more quickly. We would have to have a law that required them to file within a certain period of time. I'll just give you my own political assessment. That law will never pass. Um, so Whereas you can go to the banks and get the data. Exactly. You can, get you can it, do that administratively. Do administratively where you don't have Now, we don't. Because human I, behavior dictates that that. No, 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 no. But you can get access to that data without a law in right. order to Right. Got it. But let me also say, it's a pilot in three states. Right. We don't know yet whether or not it's going to work. And also, we're hearing from, the, from uh, worker advocates that they have concerns about privacy. So there's still a lot to work through. What Danny's point is, there's a lot of different pieces of this, and we want to learn a lot about each of the pieces. And so the idea of having several different centers, mm -hmm. which we're not, we're not there yet, but we're thinking about yeah. it, where so you have different places that are expert, like three, the three pilot states, if it works in one and it works really great, they may now be the new center for excellence with respect to working with financial services. Don't I have to fill out this thing for the Treasury that's like W-2? Don't I have to actually go out and say, as, as, as I become employed, yes. tax has come out. Right. right, and so that information is protected as I'm not, well. Right. I'm legally That's prohibited I'm from collecting that machine. So that that would require. I know that requires law, right? Yes. Asking also, not going to pass. We have no. Aren't you don't have the ability to access that information. I see. So, so a lot. There, there, that's a bigger issue. If you, if you said suddenly, and, and this violates all sorts of privacy things and all the rest, but just as a government, we could have access to all the government information. Yes. We would have a. Have a huge ability to impact <laughs> this situation. Yes. But all I'm saying is that W-2, all you, I feel like W-2 says this is what's going to happen to taxes. The Treasury knows I'm employed. But um, they can't talk they can't to tell the labor They can't tell the labor department. They can't tell the labor They can't tell the labor department. I don't want, uh, and employed. Yes. That's protected under Section 6103 of the tax code. Yeah, yeah. Now, some right. of that stuff is not going to try. We're not giving up on that. Exactly. Exactly. Nice. 6103. What paragraph? What paragraph? Enrique, you are clearly not employed right now. You brag about that over and over again. We know your status. Exactly. So why can the bank, are you asking the bank to volunteer to give you that information? And why would that success rate be better than asking employers to give you that information? With one smaller group of people you got to talk to. It's, it's a it, we've we've historically uh, across government, um, and again this is still being tested in, in many different ways. But had success in having banks report to us uh, information that's relevant to our payments. We have a whole program in the Social Security Department, as an example, where they have um, partnered with with financial institutions mm -hmm. to figure out whether individuals are not reporting all the assets. So, so, for example, asset total is relevant to whether you get a Social Security benefit. And let's say you reported a $5,000 uh, savings account at Bank of America, yeah. and so that's relevant. Well, what happens is, is that Bank of America can network with SunTrust and figure out if that same individual had another account that yeah. they didn't report on. Mm -hmm. and, and it just so happens that so far, this bank reporting relationship. The banks tend to be more sophisticated. They're much more. They, they have so they much regulation. SDRL. They, they have, have so many regulations yeah, that they, they have. They have an unbelievable <laughs> data network that's yeah. very modern versus yeah. the states. Right. Or even are. individual. So let me one of the point. point. The end is a lot smaller, right? For employers, you have to have every employer right. involved. Right. For banks, it's a much smaller number of yeah. institutions. So it's just easier to deal with yeah. them. But, you know, if, if uh, we don't end up paying, so if we pay less improper unemployment insurance, don't businesses benefit? Wasn't that one of the discussions we had on one of our yeah, steering committees? Yeah, it was. Committees? We and talked about it last time, yeah. What, right, that's what you said to us. Right. So, so businesses are incented to make this accurate because they will pay less in... It's like pay it forward. 
it, because if you if you do a good job as a new employer, you're helping out the previous. No, employer. but it's it's more ten, that you're right at a very high level of abstraction. But in any individual case, the connection is more attenuated. So. Um, Individual employers pay taxes into the trust fund. The trust fund then pays benefits out to the beneficiaries. That's the connection. Now, different employers have different rates depending upon what their, uh, what their experience is. If you lay off a lot of folks, you're at a higher rate than if you lay off very few folks. That's the nature of every unemployment system in the country. Um, so you're saying more quickly to the NDNH, I just hired Danny Werfel, NDNH, don't give them any more benefits. Um, that will generally benefit the trust fund, but it doesn't necessarily directly benefit you in that particular case. So if there's an attenuated incentive structure. That's, that's a big part of why we're in this problem in the first place. The states don't really have an incentive, a direct incentive, an obvious incentive, and individual employers don't have an incentive. And let me just say the UI beneficiaries don't have much of an incentive to say, hey, I'm working now, stop paying me. To Danny and right. Seth, um, we've got to get to do not pay, right? Yeah. And you've got to navigate us to a 10 minute close. Right, so I think that, um, I, was I want you to make one additional point about PMAP's role. Yes, right. that's where I was going. Yeah. That's where I was going. So we have this steering committee. Role number one that we're hoping you're going to agree to is to continue to advise the Labor Department in its capacity as a member of the steering committee, and we will be the conduit for you in providing that private sector knowledge into the steering committee. Mm -hmm. Second is, if you're willing, and for whoever would like to participate, we would like to engineer a very early meeting between the steering committee and the leadership of the center once it's identified, and the members of PMAB, so that you can directly convey your or members of your team, yeah. right? Who'd ever like to participate? So those are the two next steps that we particularly like you to to agree to, if you're willing. Great. Any questions or concerns before we? Yeah. All right. And get a better word for integrity. Ice. Yeah. Just, yeah. Call, just call it ice. Call ice. Call the Integrity Center of Excellence ice. Put them on ice. I've described that already. Except that's yeah. changed yeah. the word. <laughs> In New York, I'm going to put them on ice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do not pay. Get it Ten minute it. run. So yeah, Danny. Pretty straightforward. Do you want to? Yeah. Uh, Did you introduce Dick? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. First of all, thanks to the uh, advisory board for, for uh, all your help on this. Uh, I went with Danny up to Aetna, and that was uh, an incredible day. Uh, one of the things when you get into this is that you got to remember what you don't know, and, and there's a lot that we don't know. Uh, but I think from the private sector, we have learned a lot. Uh, I also participated in a briefing from uh, someone who used to work at eBay but set up their, their processes. And that, that, too, was an incredible briefing. And the, the thing that I came away from there is that what they were dealing with and what they're dealing with in eBay is more difficult than mm -hmm. the payments world. Uh, so, but, but the processes, the sophisticated software, and he said, well, it's all math. And, and then the people behind it were the keys of, of making this work. Uh, he also said that his uh, CFO said, well, you know, what can you get my, my uh, losses down to? He said, anything you want, which goes to the point of how much you want to invest, and, and that's the return on investment to, to make this worthwhile. And that's something that, you know, as we go through this, how, how many resources we put into this versus what the return on, on stopping improper payments. Uh, on page, on slide 25, do not pay is, of course, a centralized data matching service. And, and the key is, is centralized. I think that uh, way too often in, in the federal government we have set up uh, each agency having their own thing. And I think that the do not pay is, is really a, a key to assisting agencies like labor and others to, to uh, help them do a better job. We have access within Treasury to numerous databases that are listed on, on that slide. Uh, there's some others that we don't have access to yet, uh, and it's one of those things that, that uh, Danny and Seth alluded to is that there's pretty strict laws on, on what you can obtain and what you can't obtain. And so for one part of my organization, we have access to the new hire database. We don't have access to it for this purpose. So, and that just gives you an extreme example of the, uh, the challenge. 
we also, since we're Treasury, we make 85% of the payments. So we have, you know, the, the databases for excluded parties, for death master file, and we have the information on 85% of the government payments. So we have access to a lot of information that we can match and, and help determine whether or not payments should be going out the door. Uh, the do not pay in, in some ways is similar to what we've done in Treasury on, on debt collection. Uh, 10, 12 years ago, a little bit longer than that, the law was passed where it gave Treasury responsibility for, for uh, collecting delinquent debt. And you say, well, why would you do that? Well, the reason is that because we make 85 percent of the payments. And so what we do today is we, we run all of our payments through, uh, just before they go out the door, through the debt master file. And if there's a hit, we, we take uh, assuming you know, we, every agency has a little bit different rule, but we may take we may take all of a, a tax refund payment. We may take part of the Social Security payment, and that works very well. What we want to do is is get do not pay, where we can identify payments that are questionable or or we're quite certain are erroneous before they go out the door. Uh, we know what it's like to chase people after the payments out the door and, and how difficult that is. But we really want to be able to help agencies identify these, these are potential payments that you need to look at further. And maybe in some cases, we can stop them ourselves, depending on, on the type of payment. You know, just a quick question. You make 85% of the federal government payments, but not related to what Seth, Seth was saying on the UI side of your states. Right. And what's the linkage, if any, between what you're doing at the federal level on all this and what's happening at the state level? Well, there's, a, there's a couple of things. There's, when we announced Do Not Pay, the states were very interested. Because when, we, what, what, do not, when the president directed us to create the Do Not Pay list, the, the, that came about because we were getting these, these different IG reports or GA reports saying payments are going to prisoners, incarcerated, right. payments are going to dead people, payments are going to people. Well, states right. have the same challenge. Right, right, right. You know, because you, a, a UI payment to someone who's dead. So I'm just asking about the sharing between yeah. what's So, so the, the key for us is, and what we haven't yet figured out, because all of this is in motion, is how do we establish a Do Not Pay Center at the federal level so that the Department of Health and Human Services knows who they're paying? at the same time that that benefits states. And that's a relationship that potentially the UI Center can help us explore for a particular segment of state payments. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just, all I'm saying is, Neil's got the thing he's describing here, maybe I'm wrong, and what, why isn't it as simple as the state of New York saying, I want to be able to match my payment name, I'm paying in RK Salem, I'm gonna match it to Neil's database. Is that a privacy issue? Yeah, I, th I think I think the the potential is there because in in, in the the debt collection area that I mentioned, we do a lot of work for the states in, in collecting state tax debt. We we collect uh, child support payments, and so I, I wouldn't rule out the potential. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's absolutely a quick second generation. Right now, we're getting do not pay for the eighty five percent that's federal. Right. While we're piloting, how do we work better with the states? But I think you're right. As soon as possible, we should bring those two. But I hate, to, yeah. I hate to always have the bureaucratic answer, but the answer is, is that there are constraints. So, for example, for HUD to tap into do not pay, yeah. they and they don't automatically get all the data do not pay. If to, the more data they want that's in do not pay, they have to sign <coughs> memorandums of understanding. But you're doing HUD at the federal level. HUD at the federal level. Right. Right. So we have to establish to get to, to, to comply with relevant privacy and data security issues. State to federal, but community. I think what you're saying is pure I mean, logic. Yes, I mean, it's, it's an overcomable barrier, but it's not something that can happen. Like so the, that. These are all linked together because as Seth mentioned the New York uh, State example. They were one of the, the early states that partnered with us on the debt collection, and we've collected quite a quite a bit of money from fraudulent uh, unemployment payments that went out the door. Now we want to stop them before they go out, but right. but it's all it is all linked together. Let me just quickly jump to, to uh, slide 26. Uh, one of the things that, that we're also going to be doing is uh, doing some pilots because I, I think it's, it's important for us to kind of test some of these areas quickly and see what, what the potential return is. Uh, you know, we, we have uh, really appreciated PMAB's emphasis on risk analysis, and we have, we're in the process of developing some 
uh, new data analytics approaches and, and to, to measure the, the risk. I think that's, that's key and going back to the return on investment. And we've also uh, been working and have well underway a, uh, a, an effort to standardize the data so we can do computer matching a lot more readily. So there's a lot going on. Uh, this is a new program for us. We stood it up quickly, uh, but we also are at a point now where I want to kind of step back a little bit and say, all right, do we have it right? What, what can we add? What kind of analytic tools do we need? Uh, what kind of people do we need to make sure that we're we're really hitting this and hitting it hard. And let me, and let me just summarize the bottom line up to not pay from my perspective. I think there were there were two critical key meta input points that are being integrated into the work. The, the emphasis on standardization and then the primer on on uh, risk analytics that we're using to build the analytic base. Going forward, um, I think one of the big challenges that we have is figuring out the type of information to provide to the agency. That, uh, that, is, that is most helpful and relevant. Uh, you know, so if I was back at Aetna as an example, where I want to pull back some additional onion layers is around the, the, the trade of information between this, the analytics center that they have and the business line. How is that information presented? Because we're not confident that if we just give them a data dump on all the raw material that that's going to have an impact. Yet, if it's too summary, summary level as well, we're trying to kind of figure out what that right um, report that, that Treasury sends back to the agencies that has the largest impact. So there's some, I think there's some additional so we, corporate best practices that we want to look into. So, so the first thing we do is we are very anti copies of data. We, we, we really work hard to not have the central repository get replicated out for everybody that needs it, because then you create a synchronization nightmare. Mm -hmm. And that, that's something that we're very focused on. Then we say, what are the interfaces that all the data users are going to need? But it's centralized data with the appropriate interfaces. Once you start making replicas, yeah. you One data warehouse. One data warehouse. Yeah. Uh, we, Not many. With, with the interfaces that, the, that are needed. And the interfaces don't proliferate. It's you have a process for adding new interfaces, meaning you can't just say, we'll add whatever anybody wants, because that becomes unmaintainable. And with the improvement of the electronic <coughs> payment system, the ACH, you know, those those are easily the next day, you know, you can make payments the following day. So we can build in some time to, to have maybe a day to, to do analysis and, and really put the red flag up on those where we, where we think that they shouldn't be making payments. And, and maybe the yellow for, the, for them to, Makes sense. Uh, for either us to review initially and then for the agency. It, it also seems to me like there's some 80-20 rule in here someplace. You know, and if, the, if you go all the way back to the chart on page 18, yep. um, there, there's probably, yeah, the strategic sourcing chart. Yep. I'm not in the improper payments group, so this is a little bit out of my bailiwick, but if there was a snapshot of something that looked like chart 18 for the categories of improper payments they have by state, you'd know what to go yeah, after. Yeah. Do you yeah. know? And, and we do have that. And in okay. particular in UI, we're trying to go, you know, do it back to the, going back to the metrics discussion during strategic yeah. 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 I'll send you that. Yeah. That, we'll but we also have there. the state by state. Like yeah. we can tell you if the state versus Michigan trade. That, and that, that's the key. You want the worst state <laughs> with the biggest opportunity. Right, right. right. Yeah. And start with that first. Yeah, yeah. But I'm sure that. you figured that out already. So, okay. so, we already have that posted on our website by state, by cause. Got and it. whether or not they have taken the 10 steps that we think are necessary to bring down their improper payments. Yeah. So, Paul, you, frankly, shaming is one of our most important things <laughs> in this area. And that was the goal there. Sure. And it Dunn's work. cap it is a powerful work. thing. So when you, when you think about it, it's a $10 million or so investment? Yeah. The ROI initial investment, the ROI here is actually all right. the charts. So what, what, I mean, you guys are already on this, but what you need is some early wins. Absolutely. When you start showing states and agencies right. the return on investment yep. here, yep. this thing is going to, you're going to have people giving you money because they're going to see a dollar spent has a 20, 30, 40 to 1 return. So you just need to make sure that you move to quick pilot and early results, and I think you'll have a excellent. Yeah. Anything before we leave improper payments? 
sorry to have missed part of that. Okay. Okay. You're on the right thing. Right Definitely theme. on the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Scott, you want to close the meeting just as to yeah. what's happening in the next couple of months? You're on page exactly. What? Page uh, thank you. Page 27. We just next exactly. 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 yeah. yeah. Please, that's fine. What I was going to say is, uh, let me just go ahead and um, kind of take us to the end of the uh, open portion of the meeting. Mm -hmm. PMAP, uh, page 27, inside the slides. Um, we'll have a meeting in early uh, 2013. I think we've already alluded to the fact that we put on the calendar. We just haven't picked a date as of yet. We're uh, talking first quarter? Yes. yes. First quarter, definitely. Uh, and what we'll be doing is both updating and discussing the initiatives that we've been talking about, as well as looking at and choosing focus areas to um, uh, focus our time and effort on across the course of 2013. And really looking for continued engagement between now and then, and then on into 2013. Uh, as you heard, both the folks on the improper payment side as well as strategic sourcing, as well as the 2011 initiatives, would greatly benefit from your continued involvement and your continued engagement, uh, both in personally as well as your teams. Provide some guidance to the Labor Department uh, and the states, uh, New York State in particular, uh, and provide some guidance to Joe and the Strategic Sourcing Leadership Council. And with that, we will close this meeting. Uh, so thank you very much.